Food labels, we're going to talk about them today in terms of the little rectangle that we all know, and that's so much controversy about that, and you know, that's subject of legislation and such, and then other parts of the label as well, holistically. And so, so that'll be part of what we get into. Uh, and I'm going to share some research with you, but I thought, you know, a really good way to start this would be as I started to think about these topics, and probably all of you, when you make a presentation, you start to think about, like, how did we, how did we get there? You know, what's the, what's the context for this? And uh, as Tyne said, I've been working in uh, agriculture and food for some 30 years, newspaper reporter be before that. We work with a lot of clients from uh, Texas Roadhouse restaurants on sustainability to diesel turkeys. You can, you know, go to the grocery store and see their uh, product there to microbiome for Arm & Hammer. So we're, we're deep in this space, but I thought, you know, I don't know that much about food labels and where they came from and how they got. So I decided to take a little bit of a dive into there to get some context before we started to look at then some research. And so with that in mind, I, I went and I thought, well, what's the oldest food label I could find for animal agriculture? Anybody want to guess what the, and you can just shout it out. Does anybody want to guess what the product was? Honey. Pardon me? Honey. Honey? No. Close. But it could be. And this was not an exhaustive search. This is me like looking around. <laughs> actually, actually, this is me saying to Michaela, Michaela, find the oldest food label you can get your hands on. Red Jacket brand lobsters. I thought, well, this is a good one because it's animal agriculture. I don't know if there are any lobster farmers. I kind of doubt that there are any lobster farmers here, but you could be. So what's, this food label is from the main archives, and it's from the 1880s. What's really interesting about this to me is if you look at the lower left-hand corner there, it says gold medal, Paris, 1878. So back to the 1880s, food labels for these four ounce, and this must have been on the package of uh, a box of four ounce tins of canned lobster, we're already starting to make claims on the label. So this has been with us from the beginning. And then in that search, I found some other interesting ones I just thought I would share. Liver soup. Now, you have to be careful of the internet, because I also found a lot of products that don't exist, including a bunch of them that had names that I wouldn't show or wouldn't mention here. But I think the liver soup is pretty accurate because I saw that in many places. And then uh, I, I met John here from the UK early. And I don't know, John, if you can verify this from a time in the past, but uh, if you happened to live in the UK about 100 years ago and you didn't have any teeth, there was always seniors fish and meat paste. <laughs> so uh, what is named on the label is found in the jar. And if you can see a little caricature, apparently an entire piglet is in that jar. <laughs> so. But it's soft, so you'll be able to eat it, no bones. <laughs> of course, food now labels when we think about this evolving. And, and again, I don't, I don't know if there are any cricket farmers here, another kind of animal agriculture. I'm going to Austin, Texas, by the way, tomorrow after this. So uh, there is a big cricket farm in Austin, of course, in addition to my grandson, which is why I'm going down there. <laughs> but um, these labels say uh, the future of food food on them. Crickets and roasted mealworms, the future of food. I don't quite know what to make of that, but that's kind of interesting. And, and it's the uh, sustainability of food as well. And then, you know, it's sometimes the internet gives you a gift, so I'm just at my desk, and one of the many newsletters that I've subscribed to served this up to me about a day ago. These are all food, quote unquote, meat products, except none of them have anything to do with animals. And so I'm not making any kind of judgment on that, but when you talk about confusion with the consumer and uh, what they should think about or knowing what to think about, this is all out there working on consumers and confusing them. Anybody here get a food navigator? Okay, did you see what was in it yesterday? Did you happen to notice? Well, um, I happened to just digress. I put it on my iPad here so I could see it easier than my phone. But 
so i get this issue of food navigator which is this really it's an interesting aggregator of all kinds of stories on food companies and agriculture and you might want to get that if you don't already and and if you want to know where i can you know tell you after but there's an entire list and some of these uh, i don't want to read the headlines because i know people in this audience are involved but um What's common in Silicon Valley is that you move fast and break things, talking about a cultured meat company. But that's an awful way to approach making food in editorial. They had a whole issue. Uh, an association, chilling effect of cultured meat, uh, a company represented here, Israeli clean meat startup, clean meat, you know, it's clean ideas becoming bigger and bigger. Another clean meat startup, startup yesterday, $4 million investment. Uh, somebody 3D cultured beef, so it's not cleaned meat, it's not lab grown, 3D cultured meat is this company. Unlike all the others, the 3D cultured meat company is real meat. I'm sure you'll be happy to know that. And then the very last article here is addressing consumer confusion about healthy eating. It's like, wow, yeah, no wonder it's confusing. It's confusing to me and I work in this space. So how did we get here? How do we how do we get to the idea of labels? And I thought, oh wow, you know, it pre you could argue that it sort of started with Honest Abe, 1862, launches the Department of Agriculture, leads to the FDA, and then Teddy Roosevelt, Food and Drug Act. I think nobody could argue with this one. 1906, prohibits interstate commerce in misbranded, adulterated food, drinks, and drugs. I mean. I don't know about you, I can kind of agree with that. I don't want adulterated drugs, food, or drinks. Jump ahead all the way to, anybody know when this was? Yeah, 72, somebody said. 1970, Elvis visits the White House and the government says every manufacturer should encourage to provide truthful information. So I don't know what Elvis has anything to do with this, but I came across that photo and I thought, that's just too good. I got to use that somehow. <laughs> Especially if you look into history a little bit, probably what was happening right now was Nixon. I'd love to have the tapes of that. Nixon was having Elvis uh, investigated for uh, un-American acts and all kinds of crazy stuff. But so that was 1970. But then by 1980 which uh, maybe for guys like me, for some of you, for those students back there, 1980 is probably like, what is that, sort of the Stone Age or something for you guys? I don't know. But it's, it's not that long ago that the USDA and HHS, seven simple dietary guidelines. If you think about in the context of America or you know, Europe or other places, 1980, is, it's a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. And you can read those. Eat a variety of foods. That's a good idea. If you drink alcohol, do so in moderation. That's a good idea. <laughs> so, you know, avoid too much sugar. That's something that's in the news right now, curious enough. So not bad for 1980. That's pretty good. But jump ahead, another big milestone. We're going to go forward and then we're going to come back again. 2015, those seven simple have gone to 41 recommendations, 72 page booklet, but summarized in Choose My Plate. So it's, it's gotten a lot more complicated. When did this happen? Anybody know when the, when the rectangle came to be? Gosh, I'm glad I did this research because I didn't know either. So, so I had to look it up. Well, I'll tell you, in 1990, Nutrition Labeling and Education Act passes. And that's when we started to get this effort to tell us how many calories were in food and all these other things that uh, I talk about it. I live in a neighborhood, too, like Tyne, and I, I, I say the neighborhood test. And we're at this table back here, we we're just talking about the neighborhood test that at uh, breakfast, so I have uh, Matt and Kathy on one side, Wes and Kathy on the other side, and 
all these things that we know so much about, what, you know, do they get it? Is it on their radar? And uh, they're smart people, professional people, but a lot of this is not on their radar. They don't, they don't know what we're talking about. Well, this maybe is, you know, it's a good idea. I try to read those. I don't always know, you know, the fat, saturated fat. Should I be eating it? Should I not? I'm kind of confused about that. I'm probably not that much different than you guys are on that. Uh, and other consumers are, are like that as well. So this clip kind of sums up, you know, some of this consumer confusion about food labeling. And Greg back there, I think, is going to click it for me. Oh, so my doctor, he told me to watch what I'm eating, told me to read food labels. I'm in a store reading a Fig Newton's label. I've always liked Fig Newtons. I'm trying to see if it's okay to eat them, and everything looked fine, the fat content, everything. I looked at the serving size, two cookies. <laughs> Who the hell eats two cookies? <laughs> I ate Fig Newtons by the sleeve. <laughs> Two sleeves is a serving size. I open them both and eat them like a tree chipper. <laughs> Fig Newton shavings coming off the side. <laughs> and I put a Newton catch and empty that bag out as a snack. What the hell are they talking about? Two Fig Newtons. For the size of a poacher stamp. You want another one? Who well, I don't know. I've already had two whole entire fake noodles. Maybe I could try to muscle one more down, but I don't think I'm gonna. Mmm, I am stuffed to the rafters. So, kind of funny, but true because uh, you know those labels. At least that serving size. You know, I started to think about that. It, it maybe in terms of calories it fits, but nobody really eats what's on that serving size, right? It doesn't matter if you're big or small, or you like Fig Newtons or you don't. So I, I don't, I don't know what to make of that, but I think it's kind of troubling that it doesn't reflect what people really. It's the truth. Who eats two Fig Newtons? I don't eat two Fig Newtons. So what's the what's the role of food labels? Does anybody want to say what they think food labels should do? Advertise the product? Inform? Choices? Well, over time, arguably, this is kind of, you know, keep out harmful ingredients. Think back to Teddy Roosevelt. We want an accurate list of contents. That seems like a fair ask. And then we started to move into the modern area, keep America healthy. Think about that, 1970. Then we moved into keep America from getting fat. It's the truth of it. Come on, we all know the truth. And then now we're going to move into this era of enhance lives and lifestyles. That's, that's where food is going to, if you think about it. So... Our relationship with food has evolved over time. Now we're going to take a little bit of look at some research from, uh, well, first of all, Tyne showed some of these. And then, so there's, there are all these claims that are out there on food. And that, in addition to the rectangle, is part of what's happening and part of what's working on consumers. And it gets back to this idea of, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So 400 BC, this idea has been with us. Hippocrates, and unfortunately nobody knows that Hippocrates really, sorry to pop the bubble, but if you dig into this, nobody knows whether he really said that or not, but it sounds really good, doesn't it? And that statue looks pretty smart. and. 400 BC is a long time ago, so it must be true. I want it to be true, whether it's not or not, I'm not sure. But uh, that idea is out there and probably stronger in society, in America at least, than it's ever been before. Now, here's some recent uh, information from our friends in the government to help us make sense of that so we can be healthy. 
I don't think this one's going to pass the neighbor test. I don't think Matt and Kathy are going to be reading that. That's probably great information. And as I'm talking to you, I believe because I'm standing up here and what I do for a living, I should have every reason to have read every bit of that because I'm showing it to you on a slide. But I'm just realizing, almost embarrassing, you know what, I didn't, need it. I didn't read it either. And, you know, and I have vested interests. I mean, I scanned it. That's probably what everybody's doing. So that's not the solution of what to do either. So where is this all, where is this all going to take us? And now we'll uh, delve into a few things. And this, this first part is with the help of uh, my friends at Data Essentials. Do you guys know Data Essentials at all? Their research, Laura, I see you raise your hand. Their research firm uh, that does a lot of work in food and agriculture on trends and such. They also have a newsletter that you might want to uh, subscribe to. And if you want, you can grab me later and I can uh, put you on to that. And then there's a researcher that, that we've uh, collaborated with there, Maeve Webster. Maeve has since spun off and has her own firm, Menu Matters. but. She still works with Data Essentials. So this is some Data Essentials research. So we went, they have, they looked at consumers, healthy weight management, healthy 2.0 is feel good. Healthy 3.0 is going to take us to these benefits of functional nutrition. So if you look at it over time, they've charted consumers and consumers are moving more toward and consumers are saying, I want, thing, I want food that not just sustains me, but food that can enhance my lifestyle. And, you know, despite uh, all the difficulties or strife we might have in America, and there is a lot of poverty and homeless and all those things, but we live in a wealthy country. We have the luxury here, the true luxury of our problem with food today, collectively, this group, everybody here, everybody in this room, you know what your problem with food is today? Mine too. There's too much of it to eat. I mean, what, what a... So, I mean, digress for a moment. God bless America. What a wonderful place to live where our problem is we have too much food to eat. So that has nothing to do with my presentation, but it's just an observation. So now we have the luxury of worrying about food that has other attributes that we care about. Is it going to help me sleep? Will it make my memory better? Am I going to, you know, that last one on the lower right, beauty and appearance, apparently I'm not eating enough of those. Uh, energy and performance. So that's where Data Essentials research says people are wanting to go. But now let's get back a little bit more to, to where, where we are. Consumers say, 75%, they don't trust the accuracy of food labels. And this is going to vary. You can uh, look. This is from a group called Label Insights uh, a year or so ago. This will vary, but there's a, no matter how you look at it from uh, secondary research, people don't trust the accuracy or they don't understand. or However you want to look at it, consumers are not satisfied with it. 35% admit they sometimes confused by what labels are saying. And then I have some more recent, current research that's going to back that up. So apparently we're not doing a very good job. Also, if you think about it, though, food is a relatively complicated thing. 75% of younger Consumers want manufacturers to share information on how food is made. They'd like that shared on the label. This one from uh, Chicago Tribune. So those are just some backdrops. Now we'll get into a little bit of research that we recently did at Charleston Norwich. Two surveys, one just on general use of food labels. And then one, some new information we're sharing here, collaborated with Hannah and Kay and the Animal Ag Alliance to delve into 500 consumers to uh, ask some questions that relevant to, particularly relevant to this group. Five hundred respondents each. 
there's a slight skew to female. Ages 18 to 65 across America. So we have representatives from you know, all parts of the country. The reason that we went to uh, 500 here is we use these surveys to have a large enough sample size to be able to get us to some statistical accuracy. And then typically for our clients and for ourselves, then we'll take what we learn from one of these and do a deeper dive and find what we think is interesting and then go after that a little bit more aggressively. The reason it skews female is because uh, you know, it's not sexist, it's just a fact that women are more interested in the food and probably traditionally in America are still shopping for more food or are the shoppers, that's just, you know, that's just what happens at the grocery store, whether it's here or in Milwaukee or any place else. And so there's more interest there. It's not a radical skew, but it is a little bit more skew female. And from across America. So then what we might do is break this down and look at a specific, we, we do call out a little bit male, female, a little bit of geographic regions around the country, but then we would look deeper into that. Well, the good news is 63% of those surveyed believe that the information on the labels of food, and we're not isolating this to the rectangle or the front or the back of the cereal box time. We're saying, do you think the labels on food, uh, is it important? They say, yeah, it's very or extremely important. So as a, you know, in agriculture and food as a manufacturer, here's some really great news. Most people looking at your package, a captive audience, they want you to give them valuable information. That's a great position to be in. You know, a lot of advertising we do, people don't want to see it. Here we have a realm where the majority are saying, I want to see it. I want to partake of the information. What do you think is the first thing? Highest, what do they want on the food label? What are they looking for? Somebody want to guess? Calories would be part of it. Anybody else want to venture in like a general categories? Pardon me? Serving size. Yep. Others over there? This room? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. You guys are, you're in the ballpark. You're very warm. <laughs> over here? Nutrition is the most important. So they want nutritional information on the label, which is great. Trouble is, people don't understand it, but here's how that breaks down specifically. 71%, so a uh, majority of people are saying, the label is important, I'm going to look at it. And then they're saying, I want nutritional information. So if you have a product that delivers that, I would take that as really good news. And then it breaks down to where the product is made, ingredient sourcing. Here's one when we did this survey that really surprised me. Uh, allergen information. That's 40% allergies. Uh, just last week, you probably saw this study about the uh, you know, slight raise, a small but continual increase in autism rates in America and around the world. And scientists don't know what you know, what's causing that. And so if you think about some of those things, and uh, I don't know about you, when I was a kid, you know, you didn't hear much about people being allergic to peanuts or whatever. But now there's anecdotally, I mean, on my street, I live on a street with a lot of kids. You know, there are kids cross the street allergic to peanuts. You can't give them cookies, that sort of thing. So, so people are very interested in that. And then some of the other things, uh, they're interested, but it's not as primary. This slide is a little complicated. It looks a little complicated, but it, it, it breaks down, really. And it says, compared to the last two years, and you can think about this for yourselves, are you more or less interested in this? So not only do people think labels are important, 
nutrition information is important, 41% are more interested in that information than they were two years ago. That's, you know, that's pretty compelling. That's compelling to me. And if you think about all those claims that are out there now in terms of what food can do and this is healthier for you, that's healthier for that, the other thing will help you sleep more, that doesn't you know, surprise you. And then some of that other ingredient information, 17% are more interested in that than they were two years ago. It's not as big as 41%, but people are taking a deeper interest in this. Uh, where the product is made, ingredient sourcing, allergen information, people are more interested. And then I would just caution that some of those on the left, company practices, minus 3% information on grow, uh, growers, employees behind products, that doesn't mean that people aren't interested. What it means is that they're not more interested. In, they're, they're basically statistically about as interested in that now as they were two years ago. So, it's, so, so that red doesn't mean that they're not interested. It just means that interest in these other things has gone up faster. So I guess this is the old and new, and maybe uh, for somebody over here said calorie information is most important. Uh, so maybe that helps. And so, some of these things, those percentages out front, maybe that helps. So 71% want nutrition information on labels, how many people say food companies are doing a great job of that? Want to take a guess? Twenty-nine percent believe manufacturers are doing a really good job of putting the desired information on there. So that's not terrible. Some people think it's good, almost a third. <clears throat> 11% think manufacturers are doing a bad job of food labels. And then there are a lot of people, most people, kind of just, yeah, uh, yeah eh, sort of, it's okay, it's not great. So we could take this not so much as companies are doing a bad job, maybe as there's a lot of room because we have an audience with a high interest. Uh, it's difficult, though, to isolate, and that's why uh, I believe you would have to dive deeper into some of these issues to find out what's really going to be compelling for people. Let's move into uh, another realm here, meat and protein. So this is uh, the other survey. 500 across America, and we haven't <clears throat> uh, shared this with anybody so far. We did this just a few weeks ago. Finished it. We're trying to wait as, lo as long as possible. Hannah, who, yes, Tyne is wonderful at communicating because there, I had some questions about things, and I'd ping her, and then i get this thing. Oh, she's on vacation for three days. I'm like, <gasps> And then I would get an email from her at like 7 o'clock that night. So <laughs> pretty impressive. She was like, oh, so you're starting the survey? It's like, not yet. Oh, is that survey going? Yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> so we wanted to wait as long as we could because we wanted to be current. And all those headlines in Food Navigator, for example, which reach out to the consumers, are causing this to shift. So this is just about a month old, which is as long as we could wait to get into that survey. But again, doing some research for this one, I just came across, I thought, this really cool ad from the American Meat Institute for protein, for meat. And the, the answer to the question on the lower right there, who needs protein? They both do. So the, the young football player and you know, the dad, I presume, sitting in the chair, they both need protein. Well. I'm in the grocery store, and I'm, you know, kind of being the creepy guy. I'm taking products out of the cooler, and I'm putting them back in, and then I'm going over to the meat thing, and I'm going back over to the freezer thing, and then I'm, 
you know, it's like I, the, the surveillance camera of me wouldn't be that good. You know, they're looking for me to put something in my pocket, I think. But I came across this, uh, I, I had seen this, so I'm at work. I'm seeing this ad, and I thought, that's a cool ad. I'm going to use it. It's perfect for the group. And then I go to the freezer section, and I come across this product. And I thought, wow, I don't know if that strikes you, but to me it's like, oh my gosh, look at that. Italicized word, red background, white out of blue, but this time it's for the Boca burger instead of a steak. And so, though, you know, one is like 1960 or so, and one is 2018 in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. And uh, this has nothing to do with the research, but I thought it was really interesting in terms of reaching out to consumers. And I had to wonder to myself, it's like, wow, was the package designer for Boca Burgers researching the meat industry? I don't know. But it's a, you know, it's a good question, and I, it was just struck by the similarity of it. So Hannah and Kay and I were talking about, what about, they said, could you, in your survey, ask some things about labels that might increase purchase intent? And so we said, yeah, we could do that across America. And so we ask about all these things. And that's, that's kind of a big list, and you could probably come up with other parts of that. I would caution you not to look too much on the 46.5 at the bottom, because that, that says none of the above. But that's less than half of the population saying, these things have no impact on my purchase intent. And you know whether or not that's true, I don't know, but let's break this down just a little bit. So more than half are saying, as a matter of fact, those claims do have an impact on purchase intent. You know, the neighbor test is hard on these. So Maeve Webster, our, my uh, friend, colleague, research partner there, she and I were talking about this slide. Natural and locally raised those are pretty vague and intuitive things. So uh, if I think about Wes and Kathy, my neighbors, it's like, yeah, they kind of know what that means. Pretty easy. So that would make sense that they would say that those things. And you know, we, we all know the debate on natural and what it's been like. Some of those others are a little bit harder. But he, here's another reason why this slide is important. Because people who are interested in what's on the label are not one-dimensional. Or a lot of them are not one-dimensional. In fact, people who checked more than one checked three or more of these as being important to them. And we'll see that come up again in just a moment. So if you're of a mind, to just pick the top one, if you're of a mind to care about free range, you're probably of a mind to care about, you know, maybe antibiotic free or non-GMO or grass fed or whatever. So consumers who are like that, they're interested consumers. They're not one dimensional consumers. So another question we talked with uh, Hannah and Kay about was no antibiotics ever, antibiotic free. And 23% uh, some impact, 29% strong or high impact on purchase intent. 24% in the Northeast. The Northeast skewed highest on this. Taking together, 52% indicate moderate or high impact. So those labels out there, people are interested in that. Whether or not they know exactly what that means, I don't know. You would have to probe consumers to know about that. But they're, they're interested in these label claims, and uh, a good number of them, now that, that leaves a lot of people who aren't, 
but a good number of them are saying this has an impact on the product that I might buy. Let's move to a different part of that category. Humanely raised, animal welfare certified, those types of things that speak to how, you know, how, how I'm treating the animal. <clears throat> Pretty similar to the previous slide. 21% some impact on intent. And then you can see the, the 13 and the 12 you know, pretty similar to this on the previous. But it turns out, uh, and I have to credit Maeve with thinking to dig into the spreadsheet on this one, there's a really high correlation on, between the high, the high impact people who say antibiotic free are also the high impact on humanely raised, which maybe shouldn't be surprising but what it tells you is that, uh, okay, so if we think about the fact that people who choose one of these aspects, a lot of them are choosing multiple. And then if we isolate high impact, it's the same people. So, so it's not random. These people are committed. They're more committed to these ideas. So it's verification. You know, a lot of this we think is anecdotal. We read it in the New York Times or somewhere. This is what people are wanting. But when we ask the people, what do you think? This is what they're thinking. This isn't just some, you know, opinion. So the, those are a lot of the same people. That 17.2 is from the previous slide. Lab-grown meats. We wanted to ask a couple things about lab-grown meats. This is such an evolving... I, I, I hate to stand here and say to you, I'm going to show you some research. It's only a few weeks old and it's probably outdated. But I'm going to show you some research. It's only a few weeks old and it's probably outdated. <laughs> I mean, this is happening so fast, so radically fast. It's curious. But uh, as of a few weeks ago, a lot of people hadn't heard about it. That number is probably lower now. No reservations about eating, maybe. You might say that on that upper and upper right, that's not much. I don't know, that's 19% of people saying maybe. That's not bad. And then the 57%, you know, saying no. Well, that could be various reasons for a new category. 6%, I'm shout out to the Midwest. 6% of the Midwest. <laughs> yeah, we'll try it. All right. We're hardy people, Casey. Ollie, you're from Maine, so you're from the, you're kind of the northeast on that other one, yeah. <laughs> Casey's my colleague. And on the board, Casey Hushin. Shout out. Raises cows in her backyard. <laughs> True. We looked a little bit more into this, and if you think about it that, you know, I wouldn't eat it, you delve into it, could be because they don't understand it, because look at these. I don't trust it, it's not natural, it doesn't seem healthy. You could argue those are kind of like, lab-grown meat, what, what the heck? I'm not doing that. So there's probably a huge opportunity for education there. And then the one below that's really interesting. 36% of people are sophisticated enough to say, oh, that might not be good for the farmers that grow the animals. And, these aren't farmers we're serving. These are people like in the city are saying that might not be good for animal agriculture in a way. I thought that was pretty interesting. And then 50% of the people who would say, uh, I have no reservations. The previous was, would you eat it? This is what this one is. Uh, would you, do you have concerns with it? So of the people who say, I don't have concerns, they don't have concerns with any of the other stuff either. They're the same people. So although that slide where it says free range and such going down, the people who aren't concerned about this, they're not concerned about any of that either. So there is a committed group that's like, it's in the grocery store, it's cheap, I'm buying it. Thank you. Plant-based protein. 
So we had to ask about plant-based protein as well. Well, when, my only regret about the White Castle sliders, does everybody know this, that White Castle is piloting Impossible Burger sliders? So unfortunately, in near Milwaukee, I'm not really willing to drive down to Chicago to the, one of the pilot stores to get a slider, although if I'm in Chicago, I'll go there. Who's had the Impossible Burger? Has anybody in the back? A couple others. What did you think of it? Anybody want to shout out? It, it would have been far better had it gone through a cab first. It would have been better if it had gone. John, thank you. I met, you know, I met John at the coffee, and I said, please, you've got to participate. Thank you, sir. <laughs> anybody else? Impossible Burger, want to make a comment about it? It was average. <laughs> it was average. Okay. That's a good. Anybody else want to comment about it? Feel a strong opinion? Texture's right. Okay. Okay, that's great. Okay. No. Anybody else want to comment on it? Why well, I went uh, my kids are in Austin, Texas, so I get down there, and it's kind of a little bit of an outpost for us. I went, there's a, a, a great small group of uh, high-end burger place in Austin, Texas called Hop Dottie, and they have drop-dead delicious burgers and truffle fries. It's so good. And when they announced that they had the Impossible Burger, I took my, I dragged my whole family uh, and had them have Impossible Burgers for my birthday. It's a deal in our family, you get to choose, and everybody's got to go wherever you want to go to eat. Because I figured if, hop, if anybody could cook, I wanted to have a true Impossible Burger experience, and I figured if anybody could cook an Impossible Burger well, Hop Dottie would know how, and mine was not dry. I mean, it was medium rare. I would say about it, the texture is pretty good, All it had this crustiness on the outside that was a little weird. It wasn't a beef burger. It tasted good. Maybe I'll have one this weekend again. It was interesting, but it wasn't a beef burger. But it wasn't bad. And I could see where people would eat it. So 20% of respondents, 18 to 24, say, yeah, absolutely, yes, eat it. Combine that with uh, almost 40%. So half the people are saying, yeah, absolutely, no problem with it. If it tasted like meat and good texture, I would eat it. Interesting, up on top there, 18 to 24, 20%, 55 to 64, 3%. So it's, it's, you can see what's happening with the skew of our generations there. And then about half people say, nah, I'm not interested in it. Well, at this point, I thought we would bring in uh, another study we had worked on. <clears throat> on a plant-based product that, uh, for a client, not Impossible Burger, but this isn't the label survey, but I thought I would share it with you because it's relevant. This one was 200 18 to 24 year olds, and it was specifically about plant-based. And in order to be included, uh, we, they had to have attended college, university, or post high school uh, educational experience in the previous two years. And we asked them about plant-based protein because part of the entry to this was uh, getting them when they're young. And uh, if you don't know, that the food on campus is one of the top five decision factors now with people <laughs> choosing schools. True. There is a, uh, a pretty well-known list of top ten university chefs. You know, that was, I can tell you that was not the case when I went to school. <laughs> But, um, so that's a pretty good entry point. So scale, if they rated a 6 out of 10 that they would try it. You know, if it looked like that, I'd probably eat it as well. I mean, that looks pretty good to me. So they're definitely interested. That age group going to school is interested in plant-based. As independent, no offense to you guys, as independent as that age group thinks they are, they think it's the role of the educational institution to bring these offerings to them 
and to educate about them and to have them in a form that they're accustomed to eating food, which I thought was just kind of curious about. They, they thought that the university should have that much impact on them. And then what do they want? Um, sandwiches and wraps, and that looks like a falafel to me. I'd probably eat that too. I, you know, I, by the way, I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, um, Chipotle has sofritas, that shredded soybean thing. If you work in this industry, like, I'm absolutely going to go try that. Or the Impossible Burger, I'm going to try that. I think it's, it just helps with my understanding of the category, and I want to know what's out there. So I try all this stuff if I can manage to do it. So that young audience is definitely influenceable about you on the uh, plant-based. Well, when we look at this next clip, this is what we're trying to avoid. You can play that, Greg, please. This week on Marketplace, consumers are screwed when they're faced with all of these labels. Our second annual top 10 countdown of lousy labels. That stinks. <laughs> We reveal the spin on health claims, food that claims to make us stronger, smarter, healthier. That was from Canada, not that far away. <laughs> Some of you are with products that are in Canada, and uh, that's ultimately what we don't want to have happen. And if you were to watch that whole episode from last year, there are brand name products that you would know. They're also in the U.S. that just get lambasted. So that's clearly what we're all trying to avoid on food labels. Not because we don't want negative publicity, but because we want to have an honest relationship, or that's my belief, that's how we operate at Charleston, Oregon. We want to have an honest relationship with our consumers. Tyne, you showed a similar slide to this. I hadn't showed anything or talked about this. That's part of what's confusing as well. So many claims out there. So what, so what are we to take away from this? And you know, we can, we'll have just a little bit of time for some questions, or if you just want to share something offline, grab me, and you know, I can share this information with you or talk with you a little bit about it. But the changing relationship with food is having an impact on uh, information and needs from the consumers. Clearly, it's evolving. The fact that we're even having such a vigorous discussion on plant-based, lab-grown, sustainability, animal agriculture, clearly our relationship with food is changing. Uh, I like to tell people, when I started in agriculture, there was agriculture over here. There was, I was going to say there was food over here, but no, there was actually food kind of was over here. And then there was some kind of chasm in the middle there. And I, you know, I don't know what happened in the middle, but somehow there was agriculture and then People ate stuff, and they weren't very connected. Now, they are very connected. So that will never change. Nutrition, important. 71, more than 71%, so they want it. But what does that mean to the modern consumer? Help me sleep, don't let me get fat, you know, build muscle faster. Science remains impactful but consuming. As we have more and more information, it's impactful but consuming. I mean, think about coffee's good for you, coffee's bad for you. No, coffee's good for you. Butter will kill you. No, you should have more butter. You shouldn't eat margarine. I mean, what's a consumer to do? We all know that's true without any research. It's like scientists, please help us because I don't know what to do and I have a vested interest in this kind of stuff. And so clarity and simplicity can be at, at odds with the breadth of information also required on the food label to get this across because various consumers have different needs. So what's our point of view? Our point of view is more focus on the consumer, less on government agency, NGO, various activist groups, and more about trying to serve the needs of the consumer. More probing on, you, we know that you're interested in labels, we know that you're interested in nutrition, let's try to isolate how we can give you that information in a way that's useful for you. 
with that i want to close with a little clip that goes back to the fifty's that says we've been at this for a long time it takes five fingers to point the way to healthful eating habits after a month or two of this ralph suddenly realized that a slow change had taken place without his noticing it he found that eating had become fun what's more his health was better and he had more pep. He had more fun than he used to, and more friends. And all because he had learned to eat by counting his foods on his fingers. It's a beautiful thing. So before we have any questions, I'd just like to wish all of you a good diet because I sincerely hope that you can have more friends, more fun, and ultimately more pep in your lives. 